stations are charged with intensity and facts. The Lightning Strike Talk Radio with your host, Mohammed Fahim, broadcasting live from the heart of the city on Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio, WCPT 820 AM. Welcome to a radio show that charges through the airwaves with an electricity like no other. Here's your host, Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, Chicago. Good Sunday. And finally, we're getting some uh, some warmth coming in, John. Yeah, we have 50... <laughs> One degrees on Thursday. <laughs> okay. Coming back from Mexico was nice to <laughs> ease myself back into 30-degree weather. So appreciate that. Okay. Uh, good morning, folks. I'm your host, uh, Mohammed Fahim, uh, with the Lightning Strike. With me in the studio today is uh, John Arena. Ken DeLuke uh, could not make it in. He was not feeling well. I guess uh, the warm weather does not agree with Ken. <laughs> He's a... <laughs> okay. Uh, get better, Ken. Yep, uh, Ken, uh, get better soon. And uh, we've got a power pack show again this uh, this week, uh, this Sunday. It's uh, going to be a lot of stuff that we are covering. Obviously, we'll be covering some uh, good news and some bad news also as to what is happening all over the world. But uh, going into the morning early, we'll have uh, Dr. Mary uh, Cohen, who will be joining us, and uh, Michelle Alfano will be introducing Dr. Cohen, and you will be amazed to hear what Dr. Cohen has been doing with music therapy, for the lack of a better word, that's what I call it. Uh, also, uh, our personal of the week, and this is Black History Month, folks, so remember, we'll be uh, doing a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, information we'll be sharing with you on Black History Month and some of the achievers in the African American community. Our person of the week is actually Lou Hinkhouse, and uh, Lou is a director, producer, editor, has won numerous broadcast music projects and awards, and he's the creator of the Pulse of the Pulse TV series. He was awarded three National Ace Awards as producer for Best Music Series. And the the list of achievements that Lou has is uh, like a yard long. And uh, our segment producer, Sheila White, is going to be introducing Lou at uh, the end of the broadcast in our Person of the Week segment, which is about 9.40, 9.45. And also... Uh, June Moon would be joining us, I was told, by Sheila this morning. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. The number to call in, 773-763-9278. We wanted to start off the morning by discussing something very, very important that uh, John brought to my notice the other day. John, go ahead and take it. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so last night I was reading through some headlines, and in the Chicago, in the uh, I'm sorry, the New York Times, um, there's an interview with Kevin Roberts, who is the head of the Heritage Foundation. If you're not familiar with them, they are a, a very conservative right wing think tank that is publishing the Project 2025, which is a blueprint for transitioning uh, government towards a hyper conservative model. Uh, dis uh, deconstructing the administrative state is the okay, that term was, uh, of art. That was something uh, that uh, this uh, candidate who dropped out, Vivek Ramaswamy, was also push, uh, uh, pushing very strongly, right? Yeah, they have they have been around since the Reagan era. They have been steadily influencing policy, putting candidates up, and, and moving us towards where we are today. What struck me was the headline, in the uh, which says that the foundation's plan is for, quote-unquote, institutionalizing Trumpism. So whatever we think of Trumpism as a, a governmental model, uh, we do know that what the Project 2025 says, it, uh, it, while it has Trump's name in it, it, it's basically a form of authoritarian or fascist power structure, okay. which leads from one personality. I'll give him credit. He says he'd love if Biden were the one to, to lead this. He doesn't really care who is that figurehead, mm -hmm. as long as it's a uh, of a very Christian nationalist white centered policy set that puts power in that class and then everybody else is subservient to it. So the Heritage Foundation folks if you are unaware of that uh, I would like you to please Google Heritage Foundation go learn about who these folks are and how they want to change the fundamental nature of our country that is something that we have to be totally aware of given that there is a lot of angst right now out there uh, in the public. A lot of people are upset at President Biden. 
and his unconditional support for the war in the Middle East and his unconditional support of Israel, a lot of people are ticked off at the president. Okay, so the question comes in, and John and I have been discussing it, what is the alternative? Uh, Ken has also been speaking about this, what is the alternative? So we have to start paying attention to what is the alternative. And the Heritage Foundation is really, really been working since the Reagan administration years, and they have a plan in place which is not going to be good for any of us in this country. Yeah. So this, they uh, in this interview, and, and if they can, if I'll post this on my website and the the, the show's website. Um, you know, there he talks at some length in the interview. It's a question and answer format about Viktor Orban from Turkey, who is okay, uh, is very Christian nationalist, and has talked about how he succeeded in that model of vic- vilifying, you know, and establishing anti-LGBT and anti-immigration policies. Um, he's explicitly said that he wants to prevent Europe from becoming "quote unquote" mixed race over his four years term, and he's presided over a pattern of democratic backsliding in Hong. Oh, I'm sorry, Hungary, not Turkey. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's that right. what I was wondering. I mean, yeah, apologize for that. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, he's he, the, he talks in this article about you know what, why why we shouldn't be funding Ukraine, uh, and that while he's he he doesn't particularly love Putin, you know, invading another country the way he did. But we have problems here, and in, and again, in the very kind of right wing uh, cultural sense, everything is binary. You can either fund Ukraine or you can fund things that are going on in our country. And this America First model of kind of post pre World War II uh, thinking that you know we should just take care of ourselves, let you take care of yourselves. Mm-hmm. But you know the next country uh, you know after after Ukraine is Poland, and that's a you know a, a, a NATO country. Right. So where does it stop? And you know he he says well he wants France and Germany to put more money in, and yet Viktor Orban his you know his, his guy uh, voted against and vetoed um, the EU uh, putting more money into Ukraine. And so they continue to kind of play this game in my mind of we want to see these things happen, but we just don't want it to happen that way. So he wants individual countries in the EU to do more. But the EU is a unified government. It is a government Mm -hmm. unto itself. And it makes those decisions that way, um, much like a country like ours, which is unity of states, right? Oh, (laughs) boy. Which supposedly is supposed to work towards Uh, common national goals. There is so much to discuss as to what is happening in the world and in our country also. Uh, Please visit our website, which is tlschicago.com. Uh, we are starting a podcast series also for subjects in detail that we cannot really uh, discuss on the radio because of uh, the time crunch that we have on the radio. So if you go to TLS Chicago for the lightning strike, tlschicago.com, and uh, click on the podcast link, we'll be starting to post the podcast uh, the where we can go in more detail on some of these subjects. And speaking of subjects, uh, for the last uh, you know, couple of months or more now, we have been following up on what is happening in the Iowa prison systems and the Department of Corrections over there, especially in the Newton Correctional Facility with uh, Michelle Alfano uh, bringing us uh, to our notice, the case of Eric Strang. And uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going now to take a quick break, and after the break, we'll have Dr. Mary Cohen, who's got a phenomenal program that she had started of taking music into the prison system and how the system has now blocked her from uh, her ministry of, uh, of music. Uh, Michelle and uh, Mary Cohen will be joining us after the break, and we'll be right back. Are you a business looking for the right talent or a job seeker searching for your dream career? 
Look no further than the Center for Strategic Solutions, your workforce solution experts. Our experienced team at the Center for Strategic Solutions is dedicated to connecting employers with top-tier talent and helping job seekers find opportunities that truly align with their goals. We're more than just consultants. We're your partners in success. Ready to take your workforce to the next level or land that ideal job? Contact the Center for Strategic Solutions today at 1-847-306-9274 or visit us online at www.cfssus.com. The Center for Strategic Solutions, your bridge to a brighter future in the Windy City. The number to call is 847-306-9274 or send an email to info at cfssus.com. That is info at cfssus.com. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome back to The Lightning Strike. This is your host, Mohammed Fahim. With me in the studio today is uh, John Arena. With John, welcome back from your vacation. Hope you had fun. Great time in Lo de Marcos, uh, near <laughs> okay. Puerto Vallarta. Uh, Narit uh, was, the, was the state we were in. It was very beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful. At least you had fun. Uh, but hey, we are warming up now. So you brought the warmth back from Mexico I'll for us. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And uh, joining us uh, now is uh, Michelle Alfano and Dr. Mary Cohen. M Michelle, good morning. Welcome back uh, to the Lightning Strike. Good morning, Mohammed and team. So it is a great honor to be introducing Professor Mary Cohn to you. She's the professor of music education at the University of Iowa, and she has done extensive research and practice on uh, music making and well-being and peace building inside prisons. She mm -hmm. is the author of a very fascinating book called Music Making in U.S. Prisons, and she's just done beautiful work. So it's a great honor for me to share her with you today. Professor Cohen, are you here? Yes, I am, Michelle. Thank you very much for this invitation hey. and Mohammed and team. Thank Good you for morning, the work Dr. On the Good strike. morning. Thank you for so much uh, for joining us. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. You know more about Dr. Cohen and her work than I do. So, so, Professor, what I love about your work is that it focuses on peace building, peaceful ways to work through trauma. Tell us a little bit about your amazing choir, the Oakdale Community Choir, and the work that you've done in the past decade. Absolutely. So back in 2009, I began the Oakdale Choir with 44 people, 22 incarcerated or inside singers, and 22 outside singers. These were individuals that were students in my class, community members, faculty, staff, other folks. We gathered every Tuesday night inside the prison testing room when we started. We rehearsed. We had a writing exchange. We did songwriting. And then the program grew from 2009. Our last in-person rehearsal was March 3rd, 2020. Okay. The total over those 11 years, we had 174 inside singers, 136 outside, so 300 different people joined the choir. 150 original songs, 25 different concerts or events inside the prison gym, okay. and then there were um, over 3,500 different guests who came into the prison wow. for different concerts. So it really, that physical experience of walking into the prison and seeing people together, some people who have been accused of committing crimes, singing in unison and harmony with people from that community provided a space for those folks on the outside to realize our common humanity, which is a core goal of this project. Do any of you know that idea called Ubuntu? No. Go ahead. Uh, let, let us it's know a, what, what that is. Ubuntu is a South African term that means a person is a person through other people. In other words, Desmond Tutu defined it as, my humanity is inextricably bound in your humanity, okay. our interconnectedness with one another, with nature. Okay. So our Perfect. project's goal was as, yeah, as simple as building caring communities within ourselves, within all the people in our own in communities, and then broader caring communities. So, so through folks, singing, uh, through music making, through gathering, through connecting. So, folks, one of the one of the things that uh, that we have been uh, kind of advocating for 
is to bring the reform back into our reform system okay uh, the focus seems to be more on punishing people the focus seems to be on keeping people incarcerated uh, it has become a big business now uh, for the prison industrial complex and a lot of the prisons Sir john as you well know are privately owned also our country is spending 80 billion dollars keeping people incarcerated and when they come out uh, basically they are coming out as uh, spoiled uh, merchandise to put it mildly they can't put them back on the shelf and have them uh, become productive citizens and dr cohen has been trying to bring some humanity back into the prison system uh, now dr cohen you uh, were blocked by the Iowa Department of Corrections from continuing your program. You mind telling us a little bit about what happened and why that happened? I'll do my best. Yes. So, as I mentioned, the last time we met was right before the COVID-19 pandemic shut it down. Okay. And then there was a, a horrific thing that happened in the Anamosa prison in 2021 where two incarcerated individuals tried to escape and murder two staff. Mm -hmm. At that time, you know, there were no volunteer programs going on in the prison. The whole Iowa Department of Corrections looked at policies and just restricted everything they could restrict, okay. including what they are deciding to bring back into the prison. So I received an email from the warden at the time, the current warden at Oakdale on March 31st of last year saying they'd reviewed what programming they thought would be able to bring back, what they thought was sustainable, what they thought fit their programming mission, and they determined the choir was not one of those programs. Okay, and your program, basically there was no charge to the prison for that, right? There was no financial incentive for you to, to do this program, or was uh, there something that, uh, the, uh, that the prison had to pay? The prison didn't have to pay anything. Um, when there were concerts, you know, staff members did need to work to, mm -hmm. to facilitate the security process of right. bringing community members in. So that was definitely something that involved staff power. But the actual project itself didn't cost them any money as far as and did my we, work or the volunteers. Mm -hmm. did, did the warden ever come out and share with you any kind of policy in print, in writing, as to what their mission is and how your program uh, was not in consonance with their mission? No, I responded to his email asking that exact question without an answer. Because if you look at the Iowa Department of Corrections mission, it's creating safer communities. So it, it's not clear to me why. Hey, um, uh, 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 Michelle. Would yeah. you mind sharing with us the contact information for the Iowa Department of Corrections and, and the warden? Uh, folks, I tried to reach out to the warden. Uh, I am blocked by the prison system, by the warden, in speaking to Eric Strang, the prisoner that we were advocating for. Uh, because, uh, and the last time that, the only time that Eric spoke with me, he was put into solitary confinement by the warden and his staff. So you go figure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to hold these people accountable, okay? They cannot be kings of the little fiefdom and the little kingdom over there. Michelle, can you share some numbers and contact information if you yeah. have them handy? Yeah. I, I will have to post them on our page, but we can easily post them. Uh, as you know, I've been working very much on, on the anti-solitary confinement yep. uh, efforts because solitary confinement has been so damaging. Right, and what and, uh, I love about your program, yep. Professor, is that it's exactly the opposite. It brings community together. So I will definitely post numbers on our website for people to call. So, uh, Dr. Cohen, I wanted you to please share with uh, with our listeners over here uh, some of the positive outcomes from the program. I mean, I remember you and I talking about it, and you were telling me about some of the prisoners actually writing the songs that are being performed by the choir. Sure. And relating back to your first comment, Mohammed, about the shift away from punishment, that's really mm -hmm. the clear point I wanted to make, is that, like, if someone has a wound in their body and they keep digging into the wound, it's going to keep getting worse. So what we need is ways of shifting away from a punishment mentality. 
And I have some examples, like just a few weeks into the choir project, one of the incarcerated individuals wrote, being in prison is especially hard for a lot of people because there is so much negativism. I've learned through our practices and meeting people from the outside world that mm-hmm. we are human. He said that we are human, and that is a very strong self-esteem builder. Mm-hmm. Another example, there's a brand new documentary film. It's called The Inside Singers, and it just won Best Documentary Short at the Cinema on the Bayou Film Fest last weekend. Dan Coleman, based in Chicago, is the filmmaker. I can tell you a little bit about why he started it. There's another example of an incarcerated individual um, feeling like a sense of being punished and then having the connections with people in the community, it's mutually beneficial. The people in the community realize um, our common humanity and grow from our connections. Mm -hmm. And this one individual in the film was almost in tears when he was interviewed by Dan, when he was wondering why do volunteers even come in freely of their time to interact? Mm -hmm. And this all comes back to, if you're familiar with Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, author of Just Mercy, he talks about the value of proximity. We're mm-hmm. going to make a connection with someone. Mm-hmm. We need to have proximity. And so the work that I've done, singing, songwriting, music making, is using those artistic expressions and activities for building relationships and learning how to be responsive. And I do want to clarify that I am a music educator. Okay. Music therapy is its own profession, and it's Sometimes people in the general public get mixed up mm-hmm. if they hear the word music therapy in relationship to what I'm doing because I am not a board certified music therapist. Okay. I'm an educator and using music making and singing together to build each other up and really to think about well, what's logical about putting human beings in cages. Yes. I know some incarcerated individuals have said they needed the pause, you know, mm-hmm. to work, but being in prison, like to work through addiction, that's not it's it's like what you said it's using incarceration and you know the prison industrial complex is more than just private prisons it's all the companies i just one of my students just sent me an article yesterday saying that that some prisons are using ai for security measures and so those companies running ai are earning money through prisons through security so Mm-hmm. Whether it's the well, that's, food, uh, the clothing, the architecture, there's a lot of companies making money from putting humans in cages. Absolutely. Which absolutely. is something that doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, there is a need definitely for to hold people accountable for their actions also. So, yeah, some people need yeah. to be in prison. But once they are deprived of their fundamental rights that are outside, uh, you know, let them correct themselves, let them make themselves better. Why beat them down? I was, I was uh, mm-hmm. doing a lot of reading on, on some of the pr- prison programs. I've been very closely involved with uh, getting, uh, you know, people who are incarcerated uh, when they come out of the prison system to finding uh, them, uh, you know, productive employment so that uh, they mm-hmm. can become better citizens. And uh, I was at a lunch uh, hosted by the Safer Foundation a couple of years back before before the pandemic mm. actually uh, and mm-hmm. they they recognize employers who hire people uh, with records and uh, mm-hmm. so we were sitting there about maybe I would say about uh, two three hundred people in, in in the room and someone made a comment that among the audience probably about seventy percent of the people must have done or may have done something wrong that would have landed them in prison. They just did not get caught. Mm-hmm. That's right. That uh, is right. That is absolutely right. right. Yeah. A, a lot of us so, have done mm-hmm. funky things. Okay. Uh, yeah. And just yep. because we didn't get caught, we are out here enjoying our freedoms while these people are yeah. being incarcerated and beaten down upon. Uh, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, there is a wonderful video uh, that I have seen of Dr. Cohen's ministry in uh, in the Iowa prison system. Uh, we'll see if we can put a link to that on our website, tlschicago.com. Again, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Michelle and Dr. Yeah. Cohen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, yes, Mohammed. It's an honor to speak with you today. If, yes. if people want to voice their opinions, it would be great to call Governor Kim Reynolds, the governor of Iowa, 
and her number is 515-281-5211. And it's easy to Google that. Yes, thank you, Professor Cohen. You are such an inspiration. Yeah, and I also just want to thank Muhammad for bringing up the Safer Foundation. One of the founders of that, Say Honey Knopf, back in 1976, wrote a, a book um, called mm-hmm. Instead of Prisons, an abolitionist handbook. It's available online where she talks about all sorts of other ways of moving toward decarceration and excarceration, a term meaning like community um, spaces where people can get the needs that they have fulfilled, like Absolutely, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, try to reach out to the Safer Foundation and have them uh, come on as a guest one of these days uh, on the Lightning Strike. Wonderful. Again, uh, thank Wonderful. you, uh, Professor Cohen and Michelle. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back, folks, afterwards, after the break, with Ray Hanania, uh, who is uh, an award-winning journalist. And uh, Ray and uh, we will be talking about the recently uh, passed resolution in the city of Chicago uh, calling for a humanitarian ceasefire and uh, how that happened, what happened, what is happening in the future with this, uh, with Ray Hanania, as soon as we come back. Did you know there's an Illinois mandate that states by 2025, ComEd has to have 25% of the energy they deliver come from a green source? Because of this, plus the fees and taxes you've already paid on this program, if you qualify, you can get solar on your home at no out-of-pocket cost. This can mean an average savings on your electric bill of maybe 30 to 50%. More importantly, it would eliminate the uncertainty of ComEd raising your rates by whoever knows how much each year. Some people have noticed a 41% increase on their bill this spring, and ComEd has been asking for another 80% increase over the next four years. If your average bill is 200 bucks a month now, maybe it could be reduced to 100 bucks a month. Now, five years, would you rather pay 115 or possibly 4 to 500? If you'd like to see if you can qualify for this program, call Ken DeLuke at 312-617-8979. That's 312-617-8979. Help us save the environment and change that electric bill burden. That's 312-617-8979. Take advantage of this program while it's still available. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, folks, and welcome back. And uh, you're listening to the Lightning Strike. I'm your host, Mohammed Fahim. We come every Sunday morning, 9 to 10, with me in the studios today, John Arena, my co host, and Ken DeLuke is out sick today, so he could not make it. Uh, please do visit our website. We want to keep uh, the Lightning Strike listener supported, and there is a button there that you can send a quick donation and you can also go to patreon.com slash TLS Chicago to help support the show now. Uh, We have got uh, Ray Hanania who is a former City Hall reporter and Ray, good morning. Welcome to the Lightning Strike. Hey, Mohammed, how are you? I am doing very well and uh, very pleased to see that the city of Chicago is one of the biggest cities to pass a humanitarian ceasefire resolution. Can you walk us through what happened uh, for that uh, for that resolution, who voted for it, who voted against it, and who cast the tiebreaker vote? Well, um, first of all, we got to put this in context because many people make it sound like this resolution which condemns or, or that calls for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, mm-hmm. um, they make it sound like this is some sort of uh, vote in support of Hamas, or that the right. city council has been biased and one-sided. But I think if listeners look back and say, hey, on October 7th, Hamas attacked the this settlement and this music festival, and they killed wrongly uh, in a horrendous violence, a terrorist attack, they killed 1,200 Israelis. That mm-hmm. is condemnable. Yes. And then in the weeks after, Israel launched a massive indiscriminate assault against Gaza, which I think everybody knows has now taken the lives of more than 38,000 people. Almost 80% of them are civilian men, women, and children. I think about 40% of the dead are kids that are under 18 years of age. Mm-hmm. So that's the context in which this occurred. So what did the city council do? The first thing on October 13th, 
they passed the resolution introduced by Deborah Silverstein yes. denouncing the Hamas attack. Mm -hmm. Everybody voted for it. One person spoke out saying that it was imbalanced, but it went right through. Mm -hmm. Then on January 24th, the city council was going to pass a resolution calling for a... Uh, a uh, humanitarian ceasefire, and Deborah Silverstein, who happens to be, by the way, the only Jewish and member of the city it, right? council, she blocked it. She yep. stopped it, and she said, you can't do that, even though they've been talking about it for three weeks, because I want to introduce a resolution uh, commemorating the 79th anniversary of the Holocaust which was a very good thing to do, by the way, yes. to commemorate the Holocaust, but not to use that as an excuse to delay the vote. So they passed the Holocaust resolution. Then the week after, the resolution calling for a immediate ceasefire was introduced and amended to include a provision that said mm -hmm. it also called for the immediate and unconditional release of all the hostages that had been taken, Jewish hostages mm -hmm. taken by Hamas. Yes. This was a very balanced resolution. It called for a ceasefire in a war that 80% of the people being killed are civilians where whole cities are being destroyed, and it called without any, any equivocation for the release of all the hostages. And yet, the aldermen who supported the first denunciation of the mm -hmm. attack, half of them refused to, to support this. And when you look at the aldermen, it's very clear that it was mostly the centrist aldermen, people like Ray Lopez, uh, uh, Silvana Tabaris, Marty Quinn, Michelle Harris, Scott Wagaspak, uh, Gilbert Villegas, Brendan Riley. These are mainstream city council members who voted against it. And it got the support, though mainly driven by African American and Hispanic aldermen. The vote was 23 to 23, and Mayor uh, Brandon Johnson, who the prior week denounced both mm -hmm. the killing of the Israelis and the destruction and killing of Palestinians had to cast the tie-breaking vote. And and what's happened since then? A couple of days ago, the Chicago Tribune wrote an editorial that sounded more like an opinion column mm -hmm. denouncing the alderman and the mayor for supporting a ceasefire. Mohammed, the hatred against Arabs the hatred against Muslims, the hatred against anybody who questions the government of Israel is so intense in Chicago, it's disturbing. Well, uh, our, our governor also came out with a statement the other day uh, saying that uh, the resolution, uh, the, the ceasefire resolution was not balanced because it did not condemn, the, uh, condemn Hamas in that resolution. Uh, you want to say anything you know about that? That's not, that's not yeah, where you come down the Hamas, and they the already governor, did that, as Ray yeah. points out. And, and, what, and, and Ray, Ray, I just want to point uh, out, because I, I've actually read, this is a less than, it's a page and a half. Uh, and yeah. it, in the last whereas, which is the, the structure of these things, it says, the impacts of violence are particularly felt by our Palestinian and Jewish communities. And everything yeah. about this yeah. is about, is, was, is, a, is very much looking at both sides, that both sides are, are yes, affected by this violence. And the Anti-Defamation League, I'm on their, their list, they come out saying that this is one-sided. So it is clear that there's a, a propaganda around is, anybody who tries to yes. talk about oh, the actual Palestinians absolutely. who are dying in this. Uh, here's the, here's, this here's is the thing, purely guys, uh, political. Here, here's the thing that, uh, that I want to put out to, to, uh, to both uh, John and, and Ray. Let us assume for a minute, okay, that uh, Hamas terrorist, we all know that it was a terroristic attack, and uh, they attacked, uh, say, uh, a city in Israel, okay, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, and uh, let, us, uh, let us say that uh, they attacked uh, a city in, uh, in Jerusalem, okay, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, whatever, right? And they are hiding amongst the population oh, over there. Uh, hang, hang on one second, Ray. I think, uh, uh, Dylan, if you can please uh, take uh, Mary and, and Michelle off, please. 
Uh, we can hear them. Sorry. To, so, folks, to come back to okay. this, if Hamas terrorists had attacked a city inside Israel and they were hiding amongst the population over there, do you think that the reaction no. of Netanyahu and ID, uh, IDF no. uh, yeah, would have been to blow up the entire blocks and blocks of cities in order to get to a few terrorists? No, they would not have. In fact, I often, when people ask me about this, I say, let's say that some uh, criminals in Chicago attack a school. And we've seen uh, gunmen walk into schools and start shooting people. Do you blow up the school while everybody's inside there? Do you blow up the school and all the homes around the school because you're afraid that maybe the terrorists and the criminals have slipped out and hid in a home next door? Mm -hmm. That's what Israel's government is doing. Mm -hmm. And I want to be very clear about distinguishing this. Hamas is a Palestinian organization, but it is a terrorist organization, and many Palestinians believe that. And Israel's government, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, in my opinion, is a terrorist organization. It may represent the majority vote in Israel, but it doesn't represent all Israelis. So there are good Israelis, there are good Palestinians, and you don't just mix them up and attack everybody at one time. But what we're seeing is this onslaught of demonization. If you criticize or even mention the suffering in Gaza, they call you anti-Semitic. If, like, uh, the governor's attack, his statement is just ridiculous. He yep. only is concerned about the killing of Jews by Hamas. What about the killing of Christians and Muslims by Israel's government? He didn't say one word. And not That's just the problem uh, here. And not just the killing, the entire destruction of the yes. you know the, the cities, the the universities, the the churches. You know, some of the oldest yes. churches in the region have been uh, totally destroyed, and. Uh, you know, our president is just sitting on his haunches over there and not saying a word. I mean, uh, he moved a little bit the other day by issuing an executive order uh, condemning about uh, four Israeli settlers. I don't even call them settlers, Ray. I call them, you know, terrorists. Those are not settlers. They are terrorists. Okay. They are terrorists. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's uh, call a spade a spade, folks. I don't call them settlers. <laughs> if someone wants to come and settle down by force in your house and have the military backing them up, are you going to be saying, oh, they are settlers? You're going to kick their, you know, behinds out. Uh, so sorry, folks, but this is what is happening with our tax dollars, and we have to hold our administration accountable. It's horrible. Even in the Wall Street Journal this week, they attacked Dearborn. The city yes. of Dearborn I, calling I saw it that. the center of jihadist activity simply because they passed the resolution condemning the Israeli government attacks and massacre of people in Gaza. The resolution they passed acknowledged the a need for uh, ceasefire and acknowledged the release of the hostages and still it's the media in this country that has bullied people to prevent them from being courageous to speak out like you guys. It's mm -hmm. not easy to do that when somebody throws the label anti-Semitism at you simply because you criticized a foreign government. Come on. Uh, you know, the good thing for me is I served in the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And my dad and my uncle served, they're Palestinian, they served in World War II fighting the Nazis to liberate the Jews and to end the Holocaust. And so when people attack me, I point to that and I say, what did you do? What did you do? Ninety percent of the people attacking me never served this country. Some of them, though, have served in Israel's military as dual citizens, but not in the U.S. military. And to me, that is really shameful. Well, that is something that uh, we will be addressing uh, more in the future. Ray, thank you so much for joining us, folks. Uh, Ray Hanania, award-winning uh, journalist thank over you. here and uh, former City Hall reporter. Ray, thank you so much for your time and, uh, you know, your, your deep insights into what's happening. Folks, uh, we'll be right back uh, with our Person of the Week. And uh, Sheila White will be introducing our Person of the Week, who is... Uh, Lou Hinkle.
Rolling House. Are you a business looking for the right talent or a job seeker searching for your dream career? Look no further than the Center for Strategic Solutions, your workforce solution experts. Our experienced team at the Center for Strategic Solutions is dedicated to connecting employers with top-tier talent and helping job seekers find opportunities that truly align with their goals. We're more than just consultants. We're your partners in success. Ready to take your workforce to the next level or land that ideal job? Contact the Center for Strategic Solutions today at 1-847-306-9274 or visit us online at www.cfssus.com. The Center for Strategic Solutions, your bridge to a brighter future in the Windy City. The number to call is 847-306-9274 or send an email to info at cfssus.com. That is info at cfssus.com. Welcome back to the Lightning Strike with Mohammed Fahim. Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome back to the Lightning Strike on WCPT, Chicago's Progressive Talk Radio Station, where facts matter. And we have been talking facts all morning today. And joining us, as a matter of fact, is uh, Sheila White. Sheila, good morning. Good morning, Mohammed. Good morning, John. How are you this morning? Very good. I am really excited to have our special uh, person of the week, who is Lou Hinkhouse. He's a board member of the Illinois Rock and Roll Museum um, and also the chairman of the media committee. And he just completed, uh, along with some great friends, an awesome documentary called The Rhythm of Life. And so as we're celebrating African American Month this month, the gentleman that the video is about is called Mr. June Moon. And so we're so excited to have with us Mr. Lou Hinkhouse. Can you explain a little bit about the project? Hi, Sheila. Thanks for having me. Great show on WCPT, as always. Um, Love that station. Great discussion you just had. Um, So the story of June Moon um, started, uh, I was working with Elkhorn Media with Sean Murray, and we were working a show together called Built to Last, and Mm -hmm. he's also a music lover, and we're talking about the Illinois Rock and Roll Museum, and he, he said, you've got to do a feature on June Moon. And first of all, I said, what a cool name, June Moon. Um, and he gave me the contact, and we contacted June Moon, and his story is so incredible. Um, and the way Sean first met him, they, did, they were doing a Steppen show on Steppen Dancing. That's a very Chicago-centric, you know, kind of soul um, mm-hmm. genre. And um, but June's story goes way back to the Staple Singers, um, and it's just an incredible uh, life story. So it took us uh, 20 minutes to get through it, and luckily I, we have Sheila White and Michael White from Road to Eternity on the board who are able to produce and direct and do some of the editing. And Michael and I work together on the editing, mm-hmm. and uh, that's the story of that documentary. The the, the incredible thing also is that. June Moon worked at Pop Staples Recording Studio, which also was where Captain Sky recorded. And previously, we have done a, a Black History Month feature on Captain Sky. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and he's another uh, Chicago artist. He still records at Jim Frederick Studio, that which is right near the museum, and he's still making great music. So, there's these deep Chicago stories of uh, Illinois stories of great music. Lou, uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, Sheila, I believe you said that uh, June Moon might be calling in also. Yes, I'm hoping that he'll be able to call in. The, the video, uh, the documentary, The Rhythm of Life, is so full of stories of different artists that are from around the United States of America. Um, all of the things okay. that they've gone through, their stories and things. So we're hoping that he calls in. He's a very busy man. But I would like to encourage everyone to check it out on Facebook today, The Rhythm of Life, the featuring r- the story of Mr. June Moon. Okay, I think uh, we have got somebody calling in, but uh, they are not picking up on, on their end. They, have, uh, they are on mute. So it could be Mr. June Moon calling us. Uh, unfortunately, we are unable can, to connect with him. I can give you a quick uh, story of the Illinois Rock and Roll Museum in 1966. Go ahead. Go ahead we started 
2018, Ron Romero, Chairman of Debbie Joe Erickson, whose birthday it is today, and mm-hmm. Richard Fredrickson, um, and we we were looking for a building, and Ron was very creative and found a great building in downtown Joliet, right on Route 66, and it's been through renovation for all these years, and it's uh, it's open now, uh, but it, with a soft open right now, the uh, we haven't opened like the full exhibits yet. But uh, people can go there uh, during days and go to the gift shop and things like that. We have a podcast studio set up. And um, basically, you know, the mission is education. And this is part of our uh, mission is to inform people that all, all, all American music has some roots in Illinois, from gospel, blues, jazz, mm-hmm. rock, soul, house, hip-hop, even country music has some roots in Illinois. And American music is black history music, you know, uh, from gospel to, uh, you know, blues, chess records. Basically, all American music has some roots in African-American music and, and heritage in, in America. Okay, I think uh, we got uh, June Moon on the on the line with us. Uh, good morning. Welcome to WCPT. Welcome to the Lightning Strike. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hi, this is June. Can you hear me? Yes, June, we can hear you. So uh, we are hearing a lot about uh, you from, from Lou, and now we got uh, the man himself. Good morning. Welcome to the Like Strike. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. So uh, what is the story, June? We want to hear from you. Well, it's uh, um, I, I thought that they did an excellent job um, with the um, mini doc. They mm-hmm. pretty much told stories but i've been a i you know i was born i think a drummer and uh, watching tv watching regal star and the beatles way back i think that was <laughs> hey uh, you're I, dating I, yourself and me both uh, absolutely absolutely but i was hooked uh, i started playing drums at the, around the age of maybe eight seven seven and um i was neighbors with um purpose staples uh-huh. and found out that I could play drums and introduced me to Pops and the rest of this is history. I was <laughs> playing drums with the Staples and I was the first drummer to ever tour with them at the ripe age of about I went on the road with them when I was like about 9 or 10. Wow. And uh, it was just, it, it was an incredible experience the knowledge and, and it was also the height of the Civil Rights Movement. And um, so you know it, it, as a kid I didn't, I didn't experience much about that until my experience on the road with the Staples when we would go down south, and I would inadvertently, mistakenly, drink at the wrong water fountain, <laughs> and um, Purvis, yeah, Purvis would have to snatch me away and explain to me, and I didn't pay any attention to the signs because they were white only. You know, everything was segregated. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. See, this is how far we have come from those days. And now, yes. for people like the Heritage Foundation trying to take us back to mm-hmm. a world that we are going to regret ever being born in, live alone, uh, you mm-hmm. know, let alone live in, uh, this is something that we were discussing before you guys uh, got on. And... Uh, John and I were talking about the Heritage Foundation and where they want us uh, to take our country, which is ridiculous. But, uh, hey, uh, any good stories you can share with us, uh, you know, about uh, your your road trips with the, with the Staples? Well, you know what? I was watching TV this morning, a program on, 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 on TV, and they were chronicling, chronicling uh, Las Vegas and how, you know, the Super Bowl is going to be in Las Vegas tonight. Mm-hmm. And um, they had uh, I, um, Wayne Newton on there. But what I got this flashback that I had, like, I mean, I remember playing there. The Staples were um, uh, opening. Actually, I wasn't playing with them then. I was a road manager then. And they did the Sands. They did two tours at the Sands Hotel with Sammy Davis Jr. Mm-hmm. And I remember those so vividly that back then, and they were hot. I mean, they were opening for Sammy Davis Jr. We were at the <laughs> San Hotel. We still had to go to the kitchen to get to the stage. We couldn't go where Sammy and the other uh, entertainers went because we were black. We had to go to the kitchen oh, to boy. go. Uh, yeah, right. 
and so I was, I was, you know, again, you know, when you're in the middle of the mud, you just don't necessarily know how thick it is until you're out. And looking back now and looking at what's going on now, I get all kinds of, uh, as you said, kind of flashbacks that, you know, it, it's no need to go back there. You know, we need to be in a whole different paradigm. Um, but that, that oh, oh, the other great thing that we did that, that was memorable for me was that um, we were at the, oh, during the same time, when we, I think the second tour at the Sands Hotel, uh, Elvis Presley was at the Hilton simultaneously while we were at the Sands. Now, why does, why, to, why does that name sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he's been, he's been around a little bit. He's gone back. Okay. They say he's gone. Some people are still seeing that. I'm still seeing him. But back okay. then, um, while we were at the Sands, um, Stacks Records, which were, was where the staples recorded, they were doing a movie called um, Stacks. So I think it was Soul Folks in Action. And we had to go from, the, from Las Vegas to um, California. I think they, I forget what what arena, but it was this big, huge outdoor arena where it was recorded. And we had to be back, of course, that night for the show. So we had to borrow Elvis Presley's jet. And we got to ride in Elvis Presley's jet <laughs> from wow. L.A. to, um, yeah, to, 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 from Vegas to L.A. to, to record this, um, this, this movie. And uh, so that was very... Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. Great, great wow. stories, uh, June. Thank you so much. Uh, and Sheila, thank you so much for bringing Lou and, uh, and June on, uh, on the lightning strike for us. I think we need to do a, a full, uh, you know, podcast session with these two guys. Yes, yeah, there's, there's just so much to, to cover. And, uh, Lou, uh, the, the, the museum in, uh, in Joliet. So when is it, uh, the formal opening? We have a, um, if you go to the website roadtorot.org, okay. you will see all the details of what's coming up. We have events coming up, so we're kind of gradually opening. The uh, the COVID issue hit us, you know, pretty hard with our um, with our opening, but we've got a great mayor now in Joliet, Mayor Darcy, and he's really, you know, we're all working together, and luckily we've got Sheila and Michael White, <laughs> and the whole board <laughs> okay. working hard together. So if you go to roadtorock dot org, um, I am, you'll see all the updates. I am on the on on the site now, folks. So road to rock dot org. And by the way, uh, my office is in uh, is in Joliet too. Did you know that? No. Yeah, we we're need, neighbors. We we need we need to get together one of those days. <laughs> okay. This is great. Definitely. I don't want to go to Cleveland to see my rock and roll history. I want to stay in Illinois. This is fantastic. <laughs> exactly. It's all in Illinois. It's all in Illinois. <laughs> Wonderful. And folks, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, you've been listening to Lou, who is our person of the week. And now, I think, Sheila, we got two persons of the week now, June and, and Lou both. <laughs> Okay. Definitely, definitely. Wow. And uh, we would love to have you guys uh, come into the studio one of these days so we can have a, a live one-on-one. -on -one and maybe, uh, I don't think you can bring your drums in here, June, but uh, hey, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay. hey, uh, so next next week we have to talk about who's going to win the Super Bowl. Is it going to be the Chiefs, the 49ers, or Taylor Swift? So that's, uh, that's what we'll be doing. <laughs> <laughs> My vote goes for Taylor Swift right now at this point, okay? Yeah. Even though, uh, you know, she's... Uh, She's just one of those sweet little kids, man. And now they're they're saying that she's hanging out uh, with that guy because he's getting a, a ninety thousand dollar bonus or something. She, Taylor Swift is worth like one point two billion dollars. She's a billionaire <laughs> now. <laughs> runs, runs the table so she can do what she wants. Okay, folks. Uh, uh, thank you again for listening in to the Lightning Strike. We'll see you back next week, same place, same station. WCPT. Over and out. <laughs>